All right, good evening. How is everybody? That's great. I can feel I can feel the excitement. Wilton's here, we can begin. Well, when did you come to see if anybody was here? When did you come to see if anybody was here? <laughs> huh? Thanks, sir. All right, so tonight we'll begin chapter 12 of Hosea. We're getting down into the final stretch. There's only 14 chapters. I may try to... Uh, I haven't looked at 13, uh, 13 and 14 yet. I may try to uh, consolidate them, um, but we'll just see when we get to that bridge how we're going to cross it. So we've been dealing with Hosea, and Hosea was sent to the northern kingdom to, uh, to preach against their iniquities, and Hosea was given this uh, instruction from God to go out and to marry a harlot, and the harlot in his relationship in their marriage represented uh, God's relationship with Israel where Hosea represented God and uh, the harlot represented Israel because God was showing that Israel was spiritually unfaithful. And so tonight we continue in chapter 12 where Hosea begins to compare Israel to Jacob, which if you remember Jacob, there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob, his name later is, is, is changed by God to what? Israel. Um, and so he is comparing the adventures of Jacob, Israel's namesake, to uh, the experiences of Israel. And so, and probably by doing so, because these are Jews, these, these are Israelites, they would have been familiar with the history. Uh, he's trying to get the hearer's attention uh, by saying, since we're descended from Jacob, we, we've all been blessed as God's people. We need to serve the Lord faithfully. Uh, Hosea pointed out the nation had failed to obey God and must therefore expect to be punished by him. If somebody could start us off with verse 1, please. All right, so Israel pursued the wind at home in that they propagated lies and they, they, they carried out this violence. And abroad, they sought help from other nations. And again, we've made this point several times. Where did they go wrong in seeking help from other nations? All right, yeah, that... That's a sub-symptom. Uh, absolutely, Gary, that's a sub-symptom because they, when they made these alliances, then they often had to go into battle to support the people that they made these alliances with. And these people worshipped other gods, and so they went to war in the name of those false gods. And then Israel, a lot of times, standing by those that they had made alliances with, had to go to war in the name of false gods. But, but ultimately, what should they have done? They should have relied not on man, but God. And so they made these, these, these covenants with these other nations. They sought help from these other nations. Uh, and they, they, in particular, they made a covenant with Assyria. But, but then the, the verse says that they sent oil to Egypt to seek, help, uh, seek their help against Assyria. Um, somebody read 2 Kings 17.4. And actually read 17.4 through 6. King, 2 Kings 17, 4 through 6.
All right, so you see right there that seeking help from one and then, and, and then turning around seeking help from another against that one, they, they entangled themselves and it led to uh, uh, a serious final destruction of Israel. Um, and all along, if they had just been patient, if they had just put their faith in God, if they had just relied on God, but they didn't do it. Uh, and in seeking help from these other nations, Israel was pursuing the wind. It was chasing some. You ever tried to grab a handful of wind? How'd that turn out? Not too good. Uh, what is one of the major themes of the book of Ecclesiastes? What does the Ecclesiastes writer Solomon, what does he say about vanity? All is vanity. It's grasping wind. Um, if you got a handful of wind, you ain't got anything. Uh, and that's what he's saying here is they're chasing the wind. And so concerning Israel, striving after the wind as they pursued Assyria, and they were going after the wrong thing. And the nation uh, would be their own worst enemy. Assyria would bring them down, they, they, bringing destruction upon themselves in trying to make this alliance with Assyria. Uh, anybody familiar with like the, the, the climate of like where Palestine uh, was you think about the east wind you know anything about that it was hot it was dry you ever been to you ever been to Las Vegas no it's it's wind all the time and it is hot and it is dry just if you want to go to Las Vegas turn Elvis on in the background open your oven after you've got it up to 450 degrees and stick your head in it that is Las Vegas. Um, and the east wind in Palestine was fierce. It was a hot wind uh, blowing off the Arabian desert. It would dry up and make everything desolate in its path. Um, Yeah, and which I've never I've never been there, but but I mean I just I was miserable, and and the ironic thing is I was there for a dare officers Con dare officers conference, and so you know send all these dare officers to Las Vegas I just see the huge irony in that, but I just uh, you know I just anyway they didn't ask me where to have it. Uh, somebody read verse twelve or verse two, please. I'm sorry, chapter twelve, verse two. All right, so we've, we've talked about this before, the, the, the language there, bring a charge against Judah. It's like a court case. And so just as the Lord had a case against Israel, uh, he, he's saying he had a dispute uh, of a similar nature with Judah. It's the same, uh, same word used in both passages. Figuratively speaking, God was bringing a lawsuit against the southern kingdom as well as the northern kingdom. Uh, in God's eyes, the case had already been tried and the judgment had been pronounced. Judah, it is implied, as well as Jacob, uh, used here for the inhabitants of both the northern and southern kingdoms, they would be repaid for their deeds. That's what that recompense him means. They would reap as they had sown. Somebody read verses 3 and 4, please. All right, so the mention of Jacob in verse 2 is followed by him being used as an example or, or a type or a representative of Israel. Uh, comparisons like this were commonly used by prophets. And the point that Hosea is making by using Jacob as an illustration, um, there is some question as to 
exactly what is the point that he's making. One, uh, one thought is that in spite of his failings, nevertheless, he was a good example. He was one who sought spiritual blessings through his life. Another idea is that it is possible that Hosea intended to use Jacob as a bad example. Uh, because of the, the things that he did, that he supplanted Esau, and he used deceptive actions uh, that were meant to remind Israel of their own sins. Um, and there's another third view that God could still accept Israel uh, as long as the people would return to him, and that's probably the, the, the better of the three, that, you know, because you know the story of Jacob that he wrestled with his brother in the womb, that, that uh, he, he tricked Esau, uh, and he tricked Isaac, and, and, and stole uh, Esau's uh, birthright and blessing from him. Um, in the womb, Jacob had acted out his, his status as the greater of the twin boys by grabbing his heel. You see that in Genesis 25. Uh, and then after they grew up, he, he, he again, he, he supplanted, he, 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 he kind of took away from Esau. The first, and then later in life, Jacob fled from his father-in-law Laban in Aram and returned to the land of Canaan. And, and there he prepared his household for an encounter with his brother Esau. Um, and then one night, Jacob wrestled with God, or wrestled with an angel of God. And then his struggle uh, come to a, a climax where uh, the patriarch, uh, Jacob, receiving a blessing from God, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven, striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Um, and there's another event to Jacob's life that is referred to here, and although it uh, it's kind of out of the time sequence order it precedes the story about him wrestling with the angel. Uh, Hosea puts it last for emphasis. When fleeing from Esau, Jacob had found God at Bethel. Of course, we've talked about the name Bethel. It means house of God. Uh, and so in that place, Hosea said he spoke with us. In other words, the promises God made to Jacob at Bethel were especially applicable to the nation of Israel. The Lord had said, in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed, and I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And so, um, and after hearing this in Hosea's message, the Israelites should have concluded that God is our God. He's reminding them of the promises that God has made. God is our God. We are his people because of the experiences that Jacob have. And of course, if you remember, you know, there's Abraham, there's Isaac, there's Jacob. And then Jacob uh, changes his name to Israel, as we just discussed. And then Jacob has these 12 children. Um, and, then, and then that's where the 12 tribes of Israel come from. And... Um, they should have realized our, far, our forefather Jacob found God and was blessed by him, and so we can be blessed by him. Yep. Like the point we've made in here before, whatever our vocation in life, whatever we do, we are a Christian first. You know, if I if I, if I am a street sweeper, I am a Christian street sweeper. Say that three times real fast. I am a Christian street sweeper. Um, I have to do everything colored by God's word and and controlled and within the boundaries of God's will. 
And that's exactly what we see with the Israelites is, to your point, they, they forget God's word, they forget God's will, they get out, they put themselves first ahead of God, and then they start doing the things that they want to do, and, and then just, you know, it's a little bit today, and it's a little bit more tomorrow, and it just has cumulative effects until you're so far away from God. And all they had to do was turn back to God. And, 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 and you know, we spent several chapters now where God keeps saying, just turn back to me. Just turn back to me. Listen, if you don't, this is what the consequences are going to be. This is what the consequences are going to be. And he's basically begging him, please turn back to me. I love you. I don't want to do this. But I've got to because I've said that there are consequences. But if you turn back to me, you won't have to face those consequences. And they've gotten so far away that he knows that most of them will not turn back because they've become so hardened in their hearts and, and so used to their own ways that he knows that, that while he, he will not completely destroy the nation, that there's only going to be a remnant left. And so you're absolutely right in that we, every, everything that we do, uh, we have got to flavor it with us. You know, talk about being the salt of the earth. Why is salt used? It's because salt flavors. Salt penetrates. Salt can't touch something without affecting it. Uh, so we have got to be the salt of the earth, and we have got to be affected ourselves. And when we forget what God's Word says, and if we forget that we, just like them, what, what can we learn from their example? It's easy for us to sit and, and, and look back in judgment and go, well, them, I don't know why they messed up so bad. Be careful, because we can mess up just as easily as they did. So... Uh, somebody read verse, I'll get off my high horse. Somebody read verse uh, 5, please. All right, thank you, Joe. So the promise made to Jacob and applied to Israel were certain because of the, the, the promises, were certain because of who God is. He is the God of hosts. Um, whose name is Lord. All that God is, his very nature, is invoked in the pronouncement of his name. When Moses asked him what his name was, what did he say? I am. Um, and the pronouncement of his name is a guarantee of his word. God does not go back against his word because, he, because of his divine nature, he cannot. Verse 6, please. All right, so since Israel through the, their patriarch Jacob had such a close relationship with God, Hosea here is implying that Israel should be willing to repent. <coughs> True repentance would require them to observe kindness or, or a covenant love, if you will, and would, and would require them to practice judgment or a regard for human rights, they would also have to wait for God continually. And that goes back to that argument that we were making a while ago about how, and where we've made several times, where they're trying to make alliances with other men in the world puts God to the side, puts man ahead of God. They had this covenant relationship with God. And remember that under the old covenant that they would be both materially and spiritually blessed if they were just faithful. But yet they weren't faithful and they looked to other men to try to make alliances. They did not wait on God. They did not trust God's time schedule. They did not trust God's faithfulness to them and that led them to go out and try to make these alliances and it led to their own downfall. And so they took their, their destiny into their own hands through these deceitful alliances and the Israelites had to learn to trust and do it humbly but humbly trust the intervention of God. They needed to depend on Him expectantly and hopefully as they remain faithful in his service 
whatever happens to us, as long as we remain faithful to God, it doesn't matter what happens to us here on earth. And I know we think that it does, but it doesn't. We have got to remember that there, this is temporary. All of this will go away. We have got to remain faithful to God and wait on his time frame. Um, and then another point that was made in this, this verse is uh, it, it, verse 6 here kind of parallels um, something that you see in Micah chapter 6 verse 8. But what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? You take those two Old Testament verses and you can parallel it further into the New Testament, Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law. Watch this. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these things you should have done without neglecting the other. God is telling them, be faithful, be kind, and walk with God, and y'all haven't done it. Verse 7, please. All right, thank you, Billy. And I'm glad Billy read that because his version says merchant. Uh, New King James Version says a cunning Canaanite. Uh, the idea there is a merchant, a wicked businessman. Even after God's appeal, Israel was not repentant. Um, and we've seen it for several chapters now where God is saying, please turn back, please turn back. And Israel is not turning back. And instead, the people remained in their wickedness. And so the idea of a merchant is used here. Um, a dishonest businessman, by calling Israel a merchant, Hosea is, is uh, saying that Israel could no longer be called God's nation for it had taken on the character of its neighbors. Um, deceitful scales. Billy, what, what did yours say? Balances of deceit, deceitful scales. Uh, you ever been somewhere? Where you're just like, I'll take a pound of ham, please. And they put it up there and they, put, <laughs> and they leave a hand on it. <laughs> it's, uh, well, I didn't want that much. Okay. <laughs> uh, false balances, dishonest scales, deceitful scales. It, it, it refers to the practice of using differing weights to to balance the scale for the same amount. You're cheating somebody. Uh, and they would cheat another person in a business transaction. And, and the, the Old Testament speaks several times against this because apparently it was commonplace. And God... Yeah. Well, it starts in the Garden of Eden. You do whatever you want except this one thing. And what they do? And, and man's nature is always to seek what man wants. But in our relationship with God, we have got to seek what God wants. And so Daryl's right. The, the details may be different from book to book, but the, the, but the 30,000 foot picture is that man has sinned and needs to turn back to God. And in this case, you know, here they were cheating people. Um, Israel was like a crooked, oppressive merchant. Uh, verse 8, please. All right. So, what do you think about their attitude there? A little discussion. 
pride, okay, yeah, pride, uh, or, or even, uh, what's another word that kind of goes along with pride but starts with an A? Arrogant. Uh, I have become rich. I have found wealth. What else? There's something else there. <laughs> okay, so what, what are they saying? I'm perfect. Okay, is, any, is anybody that was born of a woman, I'm not against that's not misogynistic, is anybody that's not God or Jesus, are they perfect? No, but listen to them. In all my labors they shall find no iniquity that is sin. Well, what does God say? We're all sinful, for all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Um, and so they... Their very statements are pointing out their own sinfulness, that they were either willfully ignorant of their true spiritual condition or they were brazenly deceitful about their situation. Um, have you ever seen people who, who you thought they acted like they thought they had no sin? I don't know. That back seat is awful popular. <laughs> You're exactly right. Well, I mean, you know, Ephraim referring to Israel, yeah, they, you know, again, they forgot about God. They, they forgot about the blessings that God provides. God was still providing them blessings. And, of course, we've studied in the past where, you know, they would have material wealth because of God, and they would use that material wealth and turn around and worship false gods with the blessings that the true God had given them. And here they're just like, look at, you know, I have made... You know, and that's why, you know, every Sunday we get up and we thank God when we, when we offer a portion back that we thank God for the talents and the abilities and, and the, the, the vocations that he has given us so that we might, you know, be able to support ourselves because of the blessings <coughs> that he has given us. And... Uh, Exactly. God's in control, and if we forget that, we're in trouble. And uh, somebody read verse 9, please. All right, thank you, sir. And so he's reminded the people of his relationship with their father Jacob, and, and, and then he condemned their sin, and now he's reminding them that he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And, of course, Egypt was just a vacation spot for the Hebrews, wasn't it? Just an absolute, it was like sandals. Sandals, huh? Free work. I mean, they were slaves. I mean, you know, they went there and things were good. Like we said, they settled the land of Goshen, and, and Joseph was uh, second in uh, power only to Pharaoh himself. But then 400 years later, uh, the Egyptians had grown to resent the, the, the Hebrews and had, had used them for slave labor and had oppressed them and God led them out and God is reminding them and he's saying I will again make you dwell in tents because after he delivered them from uh, Egyptian bondage then what did they do? It was like four days and they were back in the promised land, right? Everybody's staring at me like what? No, it was 40 years they wandered the wilderness because, why? Because 
there was a, a portion of them that were unfaithful and willing to do, and so God had to let time elapse and 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 uh, let that older generation burn off, if you will, through attrition by forty years, so that this new generation, you know. The, you ever have something given to you and you have to work for something what do you appreciate more what you work for and so uh, that generation that survived the wilderness appreciated what God had done for them more but he's reminding them I've delivered you from Egypt uh, and, and I have been your God since the land of Egypt since the covenant uh, that he made with them after their deliverance and we talked about that last week and so he's saying here that he both loved them and he had the right to punish them. And God would punish them, in effect, by sending them back to the wilderness. Uh, he said, I'll make you live in tents again. And this is uh, a reference to the, because we know, we've talked about this several times, that this captivity, this Assyrian captivity is coming and so they're going to be cut off from their houses and their fortified cities and their farmland and we've talked about how the food would just dry up somebody read verse 10 please all right so God's people had no excuse for their sin because he had so many times and so many various ways revealed to them through the prophets through their visions through their parables uh, I, you know one translation says I will give vision after vision and through the ministry of the prophets will speak parables the assurance that God had spoken through his uh, prophets may imply that some in Israel doubted the prophets you know I mean you, are they acting like they heeded the prophets? I don't know if they doubted them or they just ignored them, but, but either way, they did not listen to the prophets. And so, uh, and God is saying, I have given you ample information. Verse 11. All right, thank you, Billy. So the people were guilty of sin. The question asked at the beginning of the verse is, is a rhetorical question. Um, and it demands an answer, yes. There was two centers of sinfulness, Gilead on the east of the Jordan River and Gilgal on the west, and they were singled out for condemnation, probably representative of the whole nation. But both places were previously condemned in the book of Hosea. Um, and the iniquity in Gilead made it worthless. Uh, you know, we, we've studied the term Beth Avon before, um, a site known for its uh, uh, vain idolatry. Gilgal, the people were so involved in the sacrificing of bulls and probably to, to false gods uh, in addition to the Lord, if not instead of the Lord. Uh, but their altars were probably like... Uh, stones heaped beside the furrows of the field you know you ever who in here has got good typical Stewart County land where you got a bunch of rocks yeah uh, and, and well I don't know I noticed everybody kind of pumpkin ridge on over to Hickman Creek that said that so <laughs> maybe that's just a vein that we're dealing with there but uh, Taylor's Chapel's got his share of it so uh, but you know you, you you go and you plow and you have you just have all these rocks it, the idea was that um, stones that littered a field made it difficult to till uh, that's what what the bones from these bulls that they worshiped uh, uh, other gods with verse 12 Jacob fled to the country of Syria Israel served for a spouse and for a wife he tended sheep Jacob again is used as an example and this time is talking about he fled to the land of Aram and he worked keeping sheep in order to obtain a wife and although he initially agreed to work for seven years for Rachel Laban tricked him into working 14 years so that he could acquire both Leah and Rachel you see that in Genesis chapter 29 and so this uh, this example, it could suggest that Jacob went to, to uh, Aram, God's people worked in Egypt. Um, verse 13, by a prophet, the Lord 
brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet, uh, he was preserved. Uh, talking about Moses, so here at the, uh, uh, as a conclusion of his argument, Hosea is talking about Jacob fleeing to Aram and the work that he did there with the deliverance of Israel from Egypt by the prophet Moses. Um, somebody read verse 14, please. So Hosea showed uh, the difference between what God had done for Israel and Israel's ungrateful response. Uh, Ephraim, Israel, has provoked God to bitter anger. Uh, he spoke of the punishment that lay in wait for Israel as a consequence. Um, the Lord would not remove Israel's blood guilt. Um, blood guilt in those times implies the guilt that is incurred when you murder somebody and that guilt will be there until you pay the price um, for that murder which is uh, your own destruction and so God would not intervene to take away that guilt but that guilt would lead to their destruction um, any questions on that Of the Egyptians, you're right. Yeah, yeah, they they definitely they they were basically like, are we there yet? We should go back. You know, we'd be better off in in captivity than out here, uh, fending uh, in the wilderness. Somebody read verse 1 again, please. Yes. All right, so just a couple of points to bring out in kind of our application. Hosea said that Israel feeds on wind and pursues the east wind continually. The idea is, again, that they are attempting to make these forbidden alliances with foreigners, and there's no value in it. And in doing so, they were involved in this, this useless and unproductive activity. And the words, you know, we, we made reference to Ecclesiastes in our study verse by verse. Um, it's the same theme that, that pops up you know, given by the, the, the writer of Ecclesiastes, uh, that most people work to obtain or to experience, you know, such as wealth or pleasure. And really, is it worth it? Now, I'm not telling you not to go out and work. I'm not, you know, but, you know, if you go out here and you chase wealth, if you chase pleasure, um, you're chasing after wind because what if you're chasing after something are you placing it ahead of Jesus are you placing it ahead of Christ and if you are we've made this point many times if you put anything ahead of God or ahead of Christ you are making it your God and so in our daily lives we need to ask ourselves again um, you know every now and then stop and, and do a course correction Am I chasing the wind? Are the things that I'm striving for worth the time and effort that I put into them, especially in the view of eternity? Um, you know, I think Apple watches are really, really neat. You'll never see me wear one. Why? Because I have big old wrists. I bump at my wrists into everything because I take up a little more space than some of the rest of y'all, and I'm not spending the money on it. Uh, and something that I want you to think of 
um, what you spend your time on, you know, if you chase after something, don't put it in front of God. Don't chase after, chase after your relationship with God. And don't waste your time on things that are frivolous. Uh, because what does Solomon say at the end of Ecclesiastes? Somebody read it, verse uh, 13, chapter 12, verse 13. The whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. And if we're making anything in this world more important than Christ, then we're chasing after the wind, just like the Israelites did. What? Almost got completely through with that left. Song of encouragement this evening will be number 674. Upstairs in our study, we've been studying Hosea, and tonight we study chapter 12. And there's one verse in chapter 12, verse 8. And Ephraim, Ephraim referring to Israel, said, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they shall find in me no iniquity that is sin. You see, Israel had strayed away from God, and they had strayed away from God because they had become confident in what they thought was their own abilities. And they turned away from God. Their hearts become hardened to the point to where they took credit for all of the blessings that they had. And they even said, In all my labors they shall find no iniquity in me, iniquity in me that is sin. But we know that Romans 3.23 says that for all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And if you didn't know the whole story, that would sound like a statement without hope. But we know that God has given us hope because God has sent his son to walk among us, to take on flesh, to teach us and then to die upon that cruel cross. And his blood, being that he was fully human and fully God, his blood is the only blood that could remove man's sin. And so we are so thankful that God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son. And 
we are thankful that he has a plan in place so that we may be redeemed for our sin. If we are not a child of God, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, if you have not submitted to God's will and done the things that God asks of you, do you know his gospel? Do you know the good news of Christ that he died, he was buried, and he was resurrected three days later to take victory over death? Do you know that you need to repent of your sins? You need to change your mind. You need to turn away from doing things your way, and you need to turn towards God. Do you know that you need to tell the world what you believe in, that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins? If you have done all that, then salvation culminates in being buried with Christ in the waters of baptism. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 it's in the waters of baptism that we put on Christ so if you're not a child of God tonight then we encourage you to make that decision because we do not know when the Lord will come back but we know that he is and we do not know what our future holds beyond this very present moment so don't waste time obey the gospel of Christ. Perhaps you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, but you're like our friends, the Israelites here, and they have turned away from God. The last several chapters of this book has been a continual message, turn back to God. God is the God of second chances. And so whatever your need, whether you need to obey the gospel of Christ, if you need prayers of the congregation, if you need support and edification, whatever it is, know that we love you, we stand here, and we stand ready to support you and assist you as together we stand and sing 674. shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? day coming there's a bright day coming by and by but in time it shall we come to them that love the Lord are you ready for that day to come are you ready are you ready are you ready for the judgment day sad day coming there's a sad day coming by and by when the sinners are part I know ye not are you ready for that day to come are you ready are you ready are you ready for the judgment All right, be seated real quick. Uh, announcements this evening. Uh, keep James Seals, otherwise known as Cooter Seals, keep him in your prayers. This is uh, Tim's younger brother. Um, stage one pancreatic cancer. The prognosis is good. Uh, he's got to have surgery. I think it's going to be a week from tomorrow. Uh, but uh, it's uh, my understanding is the spot is on the outside. Uh, and that the prognosis is good. The surgery um, is rather invasive, and so there will be some recovery time, but uh, right now everything is, is optimistic, so keep Cooter in your prayers uh, that everything continues to be optimistic and go without a hitch. 
Um, Teresa Hawks, Gary's niece, uh, is uh, continuing on hospice. Continue to keep her in your prayers. Uh, David said that Mr. Barry is not doing well, so um, keep him in your prayers as well. And also that David, uh, David Barnes, has had some issues arise, and so uh, keep him in your prayers as well. Are there any other announcements? So continue to keep Linda's mom in your prayers uh, as she uh, continues to battle with uh, cancer. Um, Jim and Sandy Ator have been sick for quite some time now. They've been sick for over a week. Uh, so I think Jim caught it first and then Sandy got it so continue to keep them in your prayers um, so good news Holly Mixon friend of hers I know that she's been on the slideshow uh, for prayer requests uh, but she, Jenny says that she's in remission and so be uh, be thankful for that Billy Tommy Wyatt from Pleasant View, which is Mike's brother-in-law, uh, is be uh, buried to, to, tomorrow. Where's the? Eleven o'clock visitation, one p.m. services at Anglins. Um, Priscilla is out sick, um, which you know she has three rambunctious boys to keep up with. So. Uh, Daryl's oldest cousin died uh, recently, 93. What was his name? Rex. Rex Howell. So, um, any other announcements? Marty, will you lead us in a closing word of prayer and we'll be dismissed? <clears throat> 